Ain't nothing to it but to do it. Yeah, just uh, put out a lot of content. And don't worry so much about how well it does at first. Just put out content because you want to help people or because you like making content or you are really eager to share whatever message you have. Um, so just do it. And the same thing with, uh, well, that, what pertains to your question, just make a bunch of content and put it out there. Um, uh, I always look at it as like, how can I answer the questions that I've had in a similar situation? So that's kind of like what drives the content or who I'm talking to is like, what questions do they have? Who's my audience? And that's what just drives the content. Like whatever comes to mind, like that's what I'm putting out. I think we all can say that you, at one point we're probably very critical of ourselves, but then we realize like, you just, like he said, you just got to put it out, put yourself out there. Um, and then there's, you know, just, it'll end up happening one way or another. Like it's just, it takes a lot of time, uh, but it'll just work its way out. Yeah, I would say definitely try and find your voice. It's going to feel <clears throat> awkward when you start because you honestly won't have an identity. You won't really know like, what's my niche? You know, like who do I really want to talk to? So you might start talking about things that you're interested in at first, and that's a very good thing. But over time, you'll kind of self-select where you want to go. Where say, okay, like I, I want to coach, let's say, football athletes. That's kind of what my passion is. And try and not give a unique spin on it. You always want to be authentic. But what's a space that I could try and fill? You know, like is, is this area saturated, right? It's like, oh, like let's say you wanted to be a, a bikini model. I'm like, buddy, I got bad news for you. It's really saturated. It's tough competition. And so I think specificity in terms of what you try and talk about is more important now than generalizing you know so it pays to be passionate about something and I would ultimately because there are a lot of people trying to do this I would say that it's about depth not breadth right so like kind of going into something finding out I'm not even saying the level of knowledge the complexity but I'm saying your passion for something it could be super specific like Discus, uh, discus throwers, like I just love it for some reason. That's what I like to do. I want to coach those people. Yeah, man, you don't need a hundred thousand followers. If you could find your niche and that's your niche, own it. Yeah, I think it was, uh, I think it's a book, A Thousand True Fans. And it's, it literally breaks down that all you need is a thousand people uh, to just buy into what you're about. And that could set you up for all the success you'd ever basically would, would need or want to provide for your life or fulfill yourself. Um, so I think people get caught up of like, oh, I need. 500,000 subscribers on YouTube. I need to get to 10K on Instagram. But rather you'd have 100 people who you really, like he said, dive deep into about something specific and that'll have a, <coughs> an overall bigger return um, down the road. When I'm in there and all that's going on, I'm Is there any way to <clears throat> lift late at night or really early in the morning? I'd try it out. I would, try, I would personally. Uh, <laughs> If, whatever, if my kids waked up, woke up at 6.30 a.m., I would get in the gym before then. Uh, that's me personally. Yeah. But uh, other than that, I would probably turn the music up as loud as I can so I can't hear them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's tough. I would say just ease up on the reins a bit. Don't uh, be so focused on your session that if anything disrupts this, my workout's gone to shit. Just, I don't know, just accept that it's gonna happen and uh, try to roll with it. But that's, that's hard. I don't, I don't have a great answer, especially because I don't have any experience in it, yeah. so. I think uh, I can kind of relate, not I don't have kids or anything, but just with the business. Like I know if I start thinking about other things outside of training, um, it can influence how the session may go, or if I know if I step foot in the office, like I'm probably not gonna train or, or whatever. Um, so for me, more recently, it's just been like focusing on uh, the opportunity I get to lift every day like as simple as that like not and I know we take it for granted right but there's a lot of people that don't get to lift a lot of people don't have a home gym or the equipment you have so it's like when you kind of reset your mind on that you're like it's a good freaking day you know what I mean it's like my kids love me and they're running around lifting weights it's kind of crazy you could make a YouTube video a channel like you know what I mean we're like a following about it like it's weird like that but um, you know just kind of reframe your mindset a little bit and yeah, you're like first world problems. Yeah. Like my kid, my kids bother me when I get to lift in my own garage. I need to go far. Yeah, really. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're a deadbeat like me and I like it. You don't like training in the morning. I love it. <laughs> I, I would say, uh, honestly, uh, what I personally have found, if you're trying to go for strength and you, I understand that where, you know, prior to lifting, you kind of want to reframe things. You want to clear your head. You want that separation from everything that just happened before. Get in the zone. 
Um, it's a little hard. And so when people talk about auto regulation, they talk about how you feel in that day, right? Or like how the performance is going to adjust uh, what you should do. But auto regulation as it relates to you could be a little bit different in that what's going on with your kids, right? Like how do you feel going into that session? Like how prepared are you feeling a little fatigued, whatever? Cool, it's like maybe make that a day that you focus a little bit more on volume instead, where that's not as stressful. You know, like if, if you're getting ready for a one rep max, let's just say this is your day, you program it's like Monday, Monday I'm supposed to hit this shit, and your kids are just yelling a lot. Like you know this is not gonna happen. Maybe it's time to readjust that. So I would say almost adjusting your intensity level as it relates to how you feel or what's going on around you. Yeah. Just doing the same amount of push-ups. Just oh, sitting yeah. there. <laughs> your kids are just going nuts. Yeah. They're like, guess I'm doing a bigger load now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Weighted push-ups. All right, so uh, my issue's been my squat. Um, my bench press, my deadlift for last year have been going up. I'm happy with those. But um, my squats stayed about the same. The reason is that every time I start getting heavy, my, I lose my depth. Mm -hmm. and I'm not sure what to do. I've been even thinking about maybe on my heavier squats not worry so much about making depth, and um, mm. I just wanted to get any recommendations about being something to consider. I probably wouldn't recommend that because 135, 225, 315 should all look the same. Um, <clears throat> but, um, man, I just lost my train of thought. Uh, if you guys have something, go ahead. I had something, something to say, but I just lost it. Uh, I just think, honestly, just lowering or like, you know, getting better at just squatting to death every time. And I was saying to you, like setting up a tactile such as pins. Like, you know, every time you're getting lower to the pins, it's going to be like you got it or you don't type of situation. And just kind of doing that over time, you're going to start to know that obviously it's getting better. Um, I, I would agree with him by saying don't just keep raising your depth. Um, so just keep trying to work on that. You're walking out with a thousand pounds. Yeah, a thousand Nailed pound that squat. squat. Yeah. <laughs> now I will say, are you just unaware of your depth in the moment? As it gets heavier, you're kind of just like you think you're squatting to depth, and then when you review the footage, you're like, oh man, I cut that three inches short. Yeah. Type of thing. Okay. That, that's what it is, yeah. So that tactile cue, either the pins or where you can set up so maybe it doesn't clang, is just a box. A, a box or a, and then you put like a pillow or just something light, so you just you graze it like you feel it, right? you squat back up. I want to recommend if you're maxing out or anything for that, but just that repeatable process, that idea where you establish to yourself, okay, I squatted this, this feels like depth to me. And then over time, you kind of just know that, you know? Uh, another thing you could do if you don't have a box, if you have even a band, you could set a band up where you just feel that touch, touch on the tush, and then you're like, all right, that, that is the depth. And then over time, I'm confident you'll be able to self-assess, yeah, I'm hitting depth or not, yeah. So I was gonna mention, uh what I would call your threshold. So if you find that every, every time I get to 250, uh, I always find myself cutting depth, right? Um, then just stop going up to 250. And maybe if you're working with sub-maximal weight for a different you know, rep and set schemes, uh, you can bump that threshold up to 275. So now every time I get to 275, my depth is, you know, I don't have as much confidence, but 250 is more manageable. Kind of similar with rounding your back. You know, every time I get to 315, my back, rounds over real hard when I deadlift. Um, maybe over time we could push that threshold up so that it doesn't happen until you get to 365. Um, so if it always happens with a certain weight, stop going up to that weight all the time. Keeping my lower back, does that necessarily mean that it's something wrong with my form? Because I find myself questioning my form a lot when I get a little fatigued in my lower back. No. Next question. <laughs> Short answer. Yeah. I would say the same thing, no. <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> Um, I don't think it's anything, anything to worry about. Um, oftentimes, you know, when we're lifting and we feel something different, we just assume it's bad. You know, like, oh, this feels different. My knee feels different today. Uh, it's important not to catastrophize and say, I know you're not, but, uh, you know, oh, I feel fatigued in my back. What am I doing wrong? Maybe nothing, you know. Um, and I might look at if you say every time I squat, my back is really bothering me, then I would just look at overall programming. Your overall fatigue, you might be doing too much. Um, but generally... No, I would say it's nothing to worry about. About maintaining my strength while losing weight. What specifically? Tips. How tips? Yeah. Hmm. Um, Slash partially increasing my strength in certain areas. Are you trying to lose a whole bunch of weight quickly, or just like you know, a couple of pounds over a period of time? <clears throat> yeah, I don't think there's anything. I think it's perfectly reasonable to expect, and I don't. Oh, I'm sorry, it's, uh, uh, it's reasonable to expect you to just maintain or increase your strength if you lose a couple of pounds. Okay. Um, a couple of pounds to you. 
I, I would oh. say percentage of body weight too, because for you, 10 pounds might be a lot, but for someone else, right. it might be a little. Yeah, so um, I think that, I think that you, there's no reason you shouldn't be able to lose a couple of pounds, whatever that means. Uh, I don't think you should expect that, hey, I want to lose five pounds. I know my strength's going to go down, so what do I do? Right. I wouldn't expect that. Uh, but auto regulation would, would certainly help with that so that you aren't uh, set to a certain percentage or a certain weight increase every single session or every single week. You just, if you're familiar with RPE, um, you just follow that from session to session. Out of curiosity, uh, what, let's just try and frame it. How much weight are you trying to lose? I don't have to name Okay. I mean, by the end of this year, we'll be, I will be down at least 10 more pounds. Gotcha. That okay. I know. So, as a skinny boy, that likes doing body recomp, and also likes to lift some weight. I've thought about this quite a bit, and I've experimented with it. And uh, I think there's a few different approaches, exactly what Alan said. I think if you're willing to go for a slower approach, it'll be far less noticeable, any potential decrease. And in fact, I think with proper programming, you can increase your strength. I think it depends upon your overall level of strength. If you're a world champion, if you're an advanced lifter, and you're trying to go down a weight class, and in that time frame, maybe it's 12 weeks, it's 16 weeks, it's not a lot of time. Yeah, you're gonna experience some strength uh, decrease. If you're a beginner, intermediate, or if you're just someone where you're still noticing it's easy to add more pounds to the bar and you wanna lose weight, I think it's entirely possible if it's, let's say 10 pounds and you wanna do it over, you said by the end of the year, so we're looking at what, maybe like 12 weeks, something like that. Um, that's a pretty short time frame. It's still possible. The other technique that I like and something I've been doing recently, and I'm gonna try and test out the bench at the end just to kind of verify uh, some of these things for myself. But the slow and steady rate, I'm a really big fan of. The thing that I've been doing, and I first learned from Eric Helms, is the concept of diet breaks. And so you could do 12 weeks where you're in a moderate, moderate deficit. So let's say 300 calories below maintenance. Okay, so you're losing maybe about half a pound, a pound a week. That's one way for sure to do it. Another way is to be slightly more aggressive for a certain block. So you do three weeks in a larger deficit, two weeks then at maintenance. But in those three weeks, instead of losing half a pound, you lose a pound, maybe 1.5 pounds. So you're a little bit more aggressive. And then you'd manage, this is getting a little bit complicated, but I'm telling you, I think this is, uh, so you would pair your training intensity to where your calories are, right? So when you're eating more maintenance and you have more energy and you feel better, you should be training a little harder, kind of what Alan was saying, like RPE, right? Where it's feeling better, well, let's lift a little bit more. Three weeks of dieting or taking three weeks of a pretty aggressive fat loss phase is not going to kill your strength, or it shouldn't, right? If you're training well, it shouldn't. But those two weeks then, you'll feel a lot better. And if you did two blocks like that, three, two, three, two, by the end of it, you'll still be down 10 pounds or eight pounds, whatever the goal is, right? Um, but I guarantee those two week maintenance blocks will feel a lot better than if you're just like, man, I'm just gonna do six weeks straight, go right into it, lose those 10 pounds. So I think cycling your intensity and your overall volume relative to what you're eating is super important. And I think for most people just in this room, if they wanna lose some weight and they're focusing on getting stronger, it's entirely possible. You're like, that was way too in depth. No. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was good. Yeah. Up on that. Yeah. First week is not quite as heavy. Yeah. So could I basically adjust my diet so I might be in a deficit, more of a deficit the first week, less of a deficit the third, second week, and then closer to maintenance or even above the third week? Would that potentially still work or is it not quite? Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, great question. Again, thinking about this way too much. <laughs> But it, so it depends on what style you want to do. I like three, the one I've currently been doing and it, it's been great. I'm uh, down now about 16 pounds in 11 weeks or 12 weeks and I would say relative body weight strength is absolutely there. Um, the bench is probably down like 15 pounds but I've lost 15 or 16 pounds so I, I think that's an acceptable loss, you know. Um, I personally like the three two but you could do three three, it depends on your timeline. Like let's say you got a meet and you're 12 weeks out and you want to, for whatever reason, you want to be in that lower weight class, like you just have that timeline, okay, like we need to talk. You need to find the right ratio that works for you. I'd say three, three, you'll be chilling. Like you won't, you won't experience probably any decrease in strength. Uh, three, two is what's working for me. I, I've had some people, I know people that do three, one. And again, I think it may, uh, depends on your overall strength levels. But what I like to do, if you only want to lose 10 to 15 pounds, 
and you're setting it up. So let's say basically they're four week blocks. You're training like five through one, right? Where it goes down and then it goes back up roughly every four weeks, right? You're building, cool. Is you start week one, which would be aggressive. Your first three weeks, you, you start at a low load and you keep building in intensity. So week three is actually pretty intense and you're actually in a pretty big deficit. But week four where it gets intense, you're back in maintenance, so you feel better. And then week five, you'd be still maintenance, but now you're on a deload or you lower back down, right, with the weight. And as you continue to build, now you feel a little bit recharged. So yeah, totally pairing the food intake to the intensity of the programming is absolutely critical. You should like, you shouldn't be on test day and it's your worst calorie week, you know, <laughs> right? So those two things, I think pairing those, I think that's, it's weird. I've uh, tried to do just a little bit of research of people talking about it. People talk about weight cuts for powerlifting and for competitions, but they don't talk enough, I think, about body composition mm -hmm. and how training performance should be affected by that. Yeah. I think um, Mike is telling like RP strength do a pretty good job yeah. uh, handling that, even like with their templates and their programming of how they do that, because they pretty much give you ranges to be in for um, your cutting phases, your light, medium, heavy days. They break that all down. Um, just a shameless plug to them. Like, I don't even. Like I've just used them in the past before, yeah. um, and I've always noticed that my strength has always been, and then Tiny, we've done it too, and it's maintained pretty well um, over the years, like ever, if I've ever used one of those. So just another thing to think about. Yeah, and Helms too. Like I know Helms is a big fan of all the longer, like bodybuilders who cut for like 12 to 36 weeks versus like a, or, uh, or over that duration. Normally like typical bodybuilders, there was always like the 12 week cut, yeah. right? And he's saying like extended 24, weight, yeah, yeah, 24 plus. And even the way their physiques look compared to like a short duration cut has just been uh, a lot better. So he's been diving into that stuff. The crazy one I'd say, Joey M, like this guy's a freak, uh, Eric, is that he managed to lose, I need to think of the exact amount, but he lost 35 pounds, I think, or maybe 40 pounds total from when he started to his competition. And he was at um, Occam Athletics and he hit a max deadlift, just like after his competition, immediately after his competition. And it was within, uh, not only 10%, within I think 4% of his all time best. I think he pulled maybe 465 or 470 and his best conventional was like 485. Yeah. And I'm like, what? You've lost 40 pounds and your deadlift has only gone down 15 pounds? <clears throat> yeah. All right, maybe you know a thing or two. Yeah, yeah I, uh, <clears throat> this is one thing that I really don't like about one-on-one -on -one coaching, like long-term, is that there comes a time when they're, they're fine without me uh, and they're just paying me to count the reps and be there um, and I don't I don't let that run far I'll let them know hey you can do this without me um, but at that point I think teaching them uh, programming is a better idea um, and then past that a lot of people like to learn the the why of things um, so going further into that here's so here's how you lift here's how you program here's why I suggest programming like this and then maybe even further than that as to here's how to teach it, here's how to coach it. Um, so that's kind of like the, the levels I would work through. Um, but yeah, I think that a lot of people feel like when they're in a position of authority as a personal trainer or, I don't know, a gym owner or a YouTuber or whatever, um, they feel like they always have to uh, say something or they always have to teach or they always have to talk. Um, when it's, I don't think it's the case. Once, these, once someone knows enough to go on their own, I'll let them know. It's time to fly. Yeah, I think even like with the group, uh, with you guys, like there wasn't much more I could say. I gave you guys cues, so I just called you over. The first says like, is there anything like that you guys want extra? Like, like what are your maybe more in depth or like the why of something? Um, and that's kind of the stuff we addressed. So it kind of ended there. But even like myself as a personal example with, with uh, Alan, like he programmed for me for a long time. And then it kind of got to the point where like I understood what we were doing. I could do that on my own, but like if I'm gonna to go to Worlds, like I'm hitting up my boy, you know what I mean? Like to help get me through that phase or maybe just the specifics of what it is. But then after that, it's like, I go back, I know enough on my own, or if I have questions, I can reach out and kind of dive deeper into something specific. I think a problem uh, before Omar goes is, I think that over coaching is a problem um, to where you just have to always say something. And then you're <laughs> convincing that person that they don't know enough to go on their own. but. Sometimes it's fair to be encouraging and say, you know enough, or even if you make a mistake, you know that you made the mistake. I don't need to constantly point it out, so.
look, Matt, it's about making money, right? <laughs> so always remind them they're never good enough, keep them emotionally weak and dependent, and you'll always have them as a client. <laughs> so I, I work part-time as a, a coach and part-time in like a, a manual labor beer distributing, so I'm always like bent over moving like cases off of a pallet onto a hand cart repetitively, so much so that it, it bugs my back. So that I guess my question would be along the lines of tips and tricks to sort of balance wanting to lift heavy and, and do my normal programming day to day throughout the week, what have you, with also having to uh, work in, in manual labor part time and still trying to, to make progress and stuff like that. So. Yeah, I'd say don't get it in your head, uh, meaning that uh, you don't want to set yourself up for that negative reinforcement. Oh, I think my back's going to hurt. Like I, I just went, I, of course, you're working a long period of time. Oh, it's fatigue. Man, I bet this session's going to suck. If you start disassociating those thoughts and just see how the weight's moving and instead try and think to yourself, what can I do today? And just leave it more open as opposed to pre-selecting what the narrative's going to be. And I totally understand, like you're doing a real job, like, we're just sitting on our butts coaching people, right? We don't have uh, that experience working a manual labor job and then going uh, and training. Just keeping an open mind to the potential, the possibility where, you know, that adage, the idea that your body lies to you, just the concept that until you start lifting the weight, you have no idea. If the bar velocity, if you know it's like, oh, this is actually feeling pretty grindy today, okay, we could talk, right? If it's feeling really speedy on the other hand, you might have a fantastic session. You might come into a workout with a sore back or you're just like, oh, man, I really, you know, it sucked. And then you start warming up and this is a better day than normal. Uh, and then I would say just be, you know, uh, extra aware or there's nothing wrong with using a belt more often. So even on your warm up sets for whatever reason, if you just tend to notice that your back in quotations fatigues easily, so you're just like, oh, like that was a rough day, there's no problem with warming up with your belt, right? From the first plate, second plate, third plate, fourth plate, as opposed to trying to see. And so removing that negative association can sometimes be a very good thing. Yeah, I think, auto, again, auto-regulation, kind of like what I said for the diet question, um, and not being necessarily rigidly held to target weights. You know, it doesn't, as long as the effort and the intensity is there, if you're supposed to work up to whatever, a set of six and leave two reps in the tank, you know, six at eight, uh, I don't, it doesn't really matter if it's 405 or it's 385. It, right, the weight on the bar is not the most important thing. It's more of managing that effort from day to day um, and reassuring yourself that uh, you are adaptive, right? And so that working and training, uh, the more you do it, the more, the, the less of a stimulus it is and the more you get used to it. Um, so uh, just encourage yourself that, yeah, it'll probably get better. And if it hasn't in a long time, uh, you know, maybe what Omar said, reframing the way you're thinking uh, and also managing uh, what you're doing in the gym because work, it's probably more important than your deadlift session, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah I was just, just trying to play with your schedule if you could. Like, even with myself, when I picked up jujitsu, I realized real quickly I have to figure out how to organize this. Um, so it could be just figuring out the training days in association with the work days, flipping some things around. Can I get in early? Is it better if I go in late? Just playing with different variables such as that and everything else that they said. Yeah, or even if you can, have your, you know, like two hard days on Saturday and Sunday when you don't work or something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, just a quick aside uh, before you ask your question. I'd encourage everyone to check out an article by Brian Miner, uh, Miner because I know a lot of uh, you guys have been talking about the concept, oh, I can't train to a certain level of performance that I want, right? Like I, I want to hit these numbers, I'm used to this level of strength and I want to go here, but you know, I got kids or maybe my work's uh, bothering me. I think we actually get the concept of progressive overload slightly wrong where we just think it's about do more weight or it's about do more overall volume. And his article, there's a lot of nuance to it, but reframing what the gym is or how to actually make progress or what progress means, I think will reinstill motivation for a lot of individuals here where we become too attached to, oh, the weight. Like, if I can't, you know, my back's fatigued, I can't deal with 405 today, this session is a wash really thinking about long term and how progressive overload works he gets into the science of it and the mechanisms and what you can do in face of you know just the simple fact that i can't lift more weight today is really good just to remind yourself that going to the gym and getting work done pretty much always is a positive thing